So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23. If you're there, say, I'm there. If it's up on the screen, say, it's on the screen. Okay. It says this. It says, stay away from every kind of evil. What kind of evil? What kind of evil? Some kinds of evil? A little bit of kind of evil? Occasional evils? Every kind of evil. You guys are paying attention. It says, now may the God of peace... Make you holy in every way. See, God making you holy is contingent upon you staying away from every kind of evil. A lot of times we want God to do a work in us, but we're not staying away from the things that prohibit God from doing something in our lives. Stay away from every kind of evil now that you have. May the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole, listen to this, spirit and soul and body. Spirit, soul, and body body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. I bring this verse up because I want to illustrate a point. A lot of times in church we get hyper spiritual and we act like everything, oh it's all about the spirit, it's all about the spirit, it's all about the spirit. Yes, but also we are spirit, we are soul, and we are So our physical body actually plays a factor in our relationship with God, who we are in him, and how we behave and how we interact with the world. And our physical body is extremely important. What we do with our physical body is extremely important because God wants all three of those things to be kept blameless, our spirit, our soul, and our body. And we get stuck when we overemphasize one and we de-emphasize the other. See, a lot of times in church, we overemphasize the spiritual side and we de-emphasize the physical side. And then in culture, it's the other way around. In culture, it's all about our bodies. And there's very little thought that goes into our spirits. And there's very, very little thought that goes into our soul. In fact, there's a lot of people that don't even know that human beings have a soul. But God is telling us, you are spirit, soul, and body, and I want you to keep all three of those things blameless. And all of those things, we need to hold them in tension. If you guys listen to me preach for any length of time, this is, this is, this is what I will, I will harp on all the time. I, I believe things that need to be held in tension. We get in a lot of problems. You guys ever play tug of war? We, we, the, the, the way God designed things is there's quite a bit of things that are kind of intention from one side to the other, and we get in trouble when we let go entirely and let one side win entirely with some of these concepts, right? So is it all physical? Is it all, is it all our body? No. There's also the spirit as well. Is it all spiritual and, and our bodies don't play a factor? No. Those ideas are held in tension between the two. Do you guys understand? So to illustrate this, I want to talk to you guys about how we get stuck physically in patterns or modes of behavior in our bodies and how our bodies can cause us to get tripped up. And I want to start off by telling you a tale of two tool bags. Are you guys ready? Tale of two tool bags. These are two uh, gentlemen that I pastored previously. And I pastored a lot of incredible people in my life. But these two guys, like I literally think back to them often when I think back to people that are just complete and total uh, tool bags. The first gentleman, he came to me, he's like, Pastor Daniel, I need you to counsel me and my wife because my wife wants a divorce. And so I'm like, okay, absolutely. Let's, let's get in. Let's have a conversation. Let's see if we can work this out. Let's see what we can do. And as I sat with him, he's like, I want to meet with you before we talk to my wife. And the, when somebody comes and tells me that, generally speaking, it's because you're trying to do some damage control. And so I sit down with this gentleman to have a conversation with him. And he's like, yeah, my wife wants to get a divorce. And I'm like, why? He goes, well, and he had some reluctance sharing with me why she wanted a a divorce. But then he finally came out and said, well, I've been unfaithful to her. And she's really upset and she's really angry. And I'm like, okay, this is obviously a massive problem. But I've, I've also, as terrible as it is, I've seen couples work through that before. It's possible if, if, if you are humble, if, you're, if you take responsibility, if, you, if, if we walk through these steps, we, there's a possibility we can work through this. There's a possibility. So, so let's have a conversation. I, I, we need to understand what happened, all that stuff. Like, you know, how did, you know, what what's the, the course of, of this situation, what happened? And he's like, well, she's really upset. She, she found out, I was trying to keep it a secret from her, and you know, she found out about this one. And I was like, well, this one? What do you mean this one? And the color drained out of his face. And he's like, well, 
I've actually had more than one affair. And I was like, but your wife just found out about this one. And he was like, yeah. I was like, does she know about the others? And he says, no. And I was like, when are you going to tell her? He's like, oh, I'm never going to tell her. And I said, how many affairs? And he's like, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've been with three women this month. And I was like, this month? What about outside of this month? You keep on using very specific language with me. <laughs> and as I start talking to this man, uh, over the course of an hour, he begins to reveal to me that at the job that he had, he had a lot of opportunities to be unfaithful. And he took every opportunity that presented itself to him. And he had had two to three affairs every month for the history of their marriage, which was 10 years. Do the math. That's, I can't, that's a lot of math. <laughs> I need one of those algebra calculators. And he was like, I need you to convince my wife to stay. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> On the contrary, I'm going to insist she run as fast as she can. He's like, well, you can't do that. I'm a good person. I just made some mistakes. I was like, no, you are a bad person. And you are doing things that are in alignment with the bad character that is inside of you, and you are using your body to act out desires that you have, and at no point in 10 years have you changed your behavior. You don't deserve this woman. You don't. There's no fixing this. There's none. This was a person who did not control his desires, and he allowed his body to do things that caused immense collateral damage in his life. There's another uh, couple that came to me. The wife came in with her husband. She plopped him down in front of me. She goes, Pastor Daniel, I love this man. I've been with him since middle school. We have three kids together. But if he does not change in this meeting, I am getting up and I'm walking out that door and I will never be with him again. I said, what's the problem? She says, he plays video games. <laughs> and I was like, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not understanding the gravity of the situation. She was like, no, you don't understand. He plays a game called World of Warcraft. It's this online game that you can really sink a lot of time into. And he played so much that he stopped going to work and he lost his job. And so I've had to take on an extra job. I'm working two jobs. We have three children. One is a small baby. I will come home, he will be sitting in his chair, he hasn't moved all day, the kids will be screaming, they haven't been fed. He will play from morning till night. There have even been times when he was so engrossed in a game that he didn't even get up out of the chair to go to the bathroom. She's like, this has to change. And I turned to the husband, I was like, I was on your side and I am no longer <laughs> on your side. And she said, if you don't stop playing these video games, I'm getting up and I'm walking out of this room if you don't commit to stop, and I'm never coming back. And she said, you need to choose right now, and your next words will determine our future. Do you choose me or the video games? Choose your words carefully. And he looked at her and he said, I choose both. <laughs> she got up, she walked out of that room, they got a divorce, she's moved on, she's very happily married now, and he lost his relationship with his wife. He doesn't, to my, last to my knowledge, he doesn't really see his kids anymore, all because he couldn't control his body. He was physically stuck. And that's not the way that God designed us to live. And we can all laugh at those, because obviously those are very extreme examples, right? They're very extreme examples, and I shared them because it's a slam dunk. Nobody's going to question whether or not that's a foolish thing, but listen, to different degrees in our life, we all have our own vices. We all have those things that have us, that we don't have them, they have us. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Those things that grab onto us that don't let go, and God didn't design you to live stuck physically. That's not the way God created you. 
In fact, there's, there's a really interesting parallel. The, the, the creator of dynamite is a man named Alfred Nobel, and he created dynamite to be able to be used for humanitarian purposes. He created it to be used for construction, for demolition. He, was, he, he thought, when I create dynamite, they're going to use it to change the world for the better. We're going to be able to like carve holes through mountains and be able to build roads that we never thought possible. And he was so excited about his invention. But then not long after he invented dynamite, people found ways to use it for harm. They begin to use it in bombs and, and explosive devices and weapons of warfare. And Alfred Nobel was so distraught at, at how his creation was used against its intended purpose that he spent the rest of his life trying to redeem the world. And he created the Nobel Peace Prize, which incentivizes people doing things that are going to help humanity. So his rest of his life, he saw his creation used for a negative purpose, and he tried to bring a redemption back to it. And I believe it's, it's a similar story with what God did with us. God created us for good things. God created us to use our bodies to bless people, to help people, to make a difference in our world. But we are using the body that God created and gave us for things that don't help people or don't bring glory to God. And so God, watching us use our bodies in the Garden of Eden to turn against him, God created all of this human history and the story of Jesus and all of this as a way of redeeming us back to him because we turned away from our intended use. God created our bodies to be used for his purpose, and we get stuck when we don't use our bodies for the things God created them for. I have four points this morning. If you're taking notes, I want you to write them down. You guys can share this on social media, tag the church. Maybe one of your friends will see it, and it'll be encouraging to them, or maybe lead them to come to church. We actually had somebody come to church this morning because somebody posted something and tagged the church in it, and they came to check it out. So feel free to put things online. First point is your body is a tool. Your body is a tool. Your desires determine how it's used. Your body is a tool. Your desires determine how it's used. Have you ever seen somebody use a tool in the wrong way? Like any of you, any of you, you parents in here, you got children and they, they, they pick up like the power drill and like, you know, and you're like, no, it's a tool, it's a tool. It's a tool. You know, my kids love playing with tape measures, and they'll just, I'll, I'll be in my bedroom, and all of a sudden, from like across the house, a little tape measure goes, shh, 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 shh. I'm like, stop playing with the tape measure. It's a tool. Their desire is not to use it to build things or to construct things. Their desire is to use it for their own pleasure and gratification. And a lot of times, we use the tools that God gave us for our own pleasure and gratification. There's two fascinating stories in the Bible of people that experienced the same physical symptom but had completely different approaches to it. The first is found in Genesis chapter 25. There's two brothers. One's name is Jacob. The other's name is Esau. Now, Jacob is a younger brother. And in biblical times, there was what was called the birthright. So the oldest child got all the inheritance and the youngest children got scraps, okay? Okay. I'm an oldest child. I wish that's still how it was, but it's not. So I feel really gypped right now. And I wish we went back to a biblical system because I would like to inherit everything and my brother can have nothing. My brother was not nice to me growing up. We're best friends now. But little brothers are from hell. And (laughs) somebody said yes with some trauma. We need to have a conversation later. But... One day, Esau, the older brother, comes in, and it says, one day Jacob was cooking some stew, and Esau arrived from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red soup. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. See, I think a lot of times, man, this is, this is the conversation we're having with the enemy, right? Like, we see something that we want, and the enemy's like, just give me your birthright. Give me the thing that God has given you. Give me the, the destiny that God has hanging over you. You don't even have it right now. You don't even have those promises yet. And then Esau says something. He goes, look, I'm dying of starvation. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all of his rights as the firstborn son to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentils. Do? It's not even good soup. It's not chicken tortilla soup. It's not soup at Descartes. It's not even Campbell's soup. This is not La Madeleine at all. It's bean soup. He didn't even trade his birthright for a good soup. He traded it for a 
bogus soup. Isn't it funny? Like, if we get hungry enough, we will sell something valuable and priceless for something that isn't valuable at all. It doesn't even taste good. It just scratches an itch. It just meets a need. It just gets us through right now. And, it, and we know that he didn't even like it because it says, then Jacob gave him the, the bread and stew. Esau ate the meal and got up and left. He just got up and left, and it says that he showed contempt for his rights as a firstborn. I think we do this in our relationship with God all the time, where God's, God has a promise for us, God has blessings for us, God has a purpose for us, and we show contempt for it by trading it for something that sucks, and then we just get up and leave. We're done consuming. We're done indulging. We're done experiencing. We just get up and walk out. It wasn't even that valuable to us. It didn't even help us. It was so worthless, but we showed contempt for our birthright. What do you think that says to God when God has all these good things for us and we trade it for something worthless and we don't even register it? And you know what's funny about Esau? It's it's like we can laugh at him and we can talk about the story. This story gets whipped out all the time, but like in reality, we're the same as Esau. He just said the quiet part out loud. What good is my birthright when I'm starving? He said the quiet part out loud. We think that. We act on it. We just don't ever say it. Because when we say it, it's ridiculous. And we know it is. But if we just act on it, we're not even acknowledging to ourselves what we're compromising. It's the same mentality that we share today. We will never be able to experience the future promises of God if we keep on trading them for present pleasantries. You'll never be able to experience the future promises of God if you keep on trading them for present pleasantries. I call them present pleasantries because that's all that they are. They're not present treasures. They're not present promises. They're not present hopes. They are just pleasant, present pleasantries. I knew I was going to get tongue-tied on that. That's it. They feel good for a moment and then they're gone. And we will never experience the promises of God that are in our future if we keep on trading them for things in the present. But here's the thing. We get more excited about something we can have in a moment than something that we can have in the future. Then something better we can have tomorrow. And we will sell it out for something insignificant today. What good is my birthright when I'm hungry now? If you were to say your quiet part out loud, what would that sound like? What's your quiet part if you were to say that out loud? The thing that you're acting on, but you would never speak like Esau. The internal monologue. If we could just hit a switch and it goes from inside to outside, what would that quiet part say if it was said out loud? What good is my purity if I'm lonely? As an example, what good is my purity if I'm lonely? Why why should I wait for a, a mate when I feel lonely today? So I'm just going to make a decision to scratch an itch for right now instead of holding out for what I know God has for me in the future because you ain't it. Why should I be generous to someone else when I still lack what I want? Why should I give to you? I don't even have my dreams yet. It's the quiet part out loud. You ever have somebody that says the quiet part out loud? I remember one time we had, uh, we had this family that was living with us for a little while. They didn't have a home, and uh, they lived with us for six months, and we were trying to help them get on their feet, and so we're like, hey, you guys just stay here rent-free. Like, we, we just want to take care of you guys. Just get your own food, but don't worry about utilities. Don't worry about rent, and we want to take care of you guys and provide a home for you and all this stuff, and, and I, I remember that um, the, the husband worked at a cabinet shop. And I had uh, a whole bunch of DVDs. I have a big movie collection, and I didn't have enough DVD shelves for them, so I had, they were just sitting in stacks on the ground and stuff. And one day, the husband came home. They'd been living with us for about four or five months at this point. He came home, and he had this beautiful DVD shelf that he had built at his cabinet store. And I help him unload it from his truck, and he takes it into the back bedroom that we had them staying in. And there's no room for it, but he, like, sticks it in, and we wedge it in the corner. And he puts all of his stuff on there. We get it all set up. And he's like, man, that, that... that DVD shelf came out great, didn't it? I was like, yeah, man, your cabinet shop did a great job. He's like, yeah, it's beautiful. I made it for you, but it came out so nice, I thought, I'm just going to keep it for myself. I was like, bro, you said the quiet part out loud. 
You weren't supposed to tell me that. I was just over here excited for you a second ago, and now all of a sudden, I don't like you very much. <laughs> Sounds different when we say it. What are the things that you're compromising, that you're contempting, but you're just not vocalizing it, but you're acting on it? See, Esau was hungry. And he made a decision to give up whatever God had for him in the future, whatever purpose that looked like, whatever promises were there. He gave it up for momentary gratification because he was hungry. But there's another man that was hungry in the Bible that had an option to give up his purpose as well. It's actually Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, if you're in your Bible, your New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Jesus had not started his earthly ministry for 30 years. And then he goes and gets baptized, and that signaled the beginning of his earthly ministry. He has this great moment where he gets baptized in the Jordan River, and he comes out, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit descended on him, and the Father spoke and said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. That's a great moment. You guys ever been baptized before? You remember when you came out of the water, you like floated out, you felt like a million pounds lighter? That's the moment that Jesus just experienced. And then we pick up right after that. It says, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, who just ascended upon him, returned from the Jordan River from being baptized, and he was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. What? Isn't it funny how sometimes right after the mountaintop moments that we experience in our relationship with God, they're immediately preceded by a valley. They're immediately preceded by a wilderness. He was led from the waters of baptism into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. That doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound delightful. I just got baptized. This is awesome. I'm excited. Everything's going good. Now I'm being led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. Not for 40 hours, 40 days. I think for a lot of us, man, like we get tripped up because we can only follow God coming out of the waters of baptism or on those moments where we're feeling spiritually high, but it's when we're in the wilderness, that's really when temptation's gonna find us. It's in those in-between places. And if you wanna move forward physically, you've gotta be filled spiritually. I believe that the reason why Jesus is going to have a different interaction than Esau did is because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you with me this morning, church? If you want to move forward physically, you've got to be filled spiritually. And sometimes God's going to lead you into places that you don't prefer to be in, and those are the times that the accuser shows up. I believe sometimes God leads you into the wilderness moments after you have those infilling moments with the Holy Spirit, those high moments, because he's about to show you the part of your flesh that still needs to die. Just because you had that great experience doesn't mean that all of you has been sanctified yet. Are you with me this morning? Like, like God's trying to show you, hey, listen, I know you're excited about what just happened, but also you're still a human being. And I believe that sometimes, listen, this is the hard part about our faith. God will let you go through storms to give you substance. God will let you go through difficult times to authenticate your faith. It says Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Verse 3, then. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, then. Look at your other neighbor and say, then. Jesus ate nothing and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, whoo, that devil picked his moment, didn't he? Jesus got hungry then. I believe the enemy is waiting for you to get hungry then. He's going to show up. Then he's going to try and trick you. Then he's going to try and tempt you. He says, then he showed up. Have you ever just realized that it's like in those moments when you're at your lowest, that's when a dark voice whispers to you the loudest. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, what a stupid thing to say. Sometimes the devil will come to you with nonsense. If you are the son of God. As if Jesus was confused about his identity, but sometimes we are. And you don't need to validate what God has already authenticated. Listen, you are a son and a daughter of God. That is who you are. And sometimes the enemy is going to come to you with some nonsense. If you really are a child of God, oh, you done messed up. I am a child of God. I was bought with a price. I have a new name, a new identity. I am a new creation. The old things have gone away. Everything has become new. What do you mean? If you are a daughter of God. You must have confused me with someone else. 
Don't let the devil come to you with some of that nonsense, trying to smuggle that into the conversation to confuse you. If you're the son of God, then tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. <laughs> I, don't, he, I don't know if he thinks Jesus is Chris Angel or David Blaine, but <laughs> weird request. <laughs> but Jesus told him, no. Look at your neighbor saying, no. No, you got to do it with, the, with the, the, the attitude fan, no. No. Jesus said, no. I'm not doing your weird trick. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone. Some of us, man, we get into trouble because we think that we live by bread alone. You don't live by bread alone. Yes, you need bread, but that's not all you need. And sometimes you get stuck because you're living your life as if all you need are physical things. But the Bible says man shall not live by bread alone. Verse 5, then the devil took him up and revealed to him the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. He said, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they're mine to give every one I please. What a ludicrous thing. The devil will promise you things that he can't deliver. He says, the kingdoms of the earth are mine, and I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. They are not, because the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That means that everything on this earth belongs to God. You cannot give me anything because nothing belongs to you. So anything you give me is nothing but a counterfeit of the thing that God has already created. It sounds tempting on the surface, but read the fine print. He said, I'll give it all to you if you worship me. But Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Notice how the, the devil's trying to confuse Jesus with lies and Jesus just answered him with scriptures. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, it's the same lie trying to trip him up with, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you and they will hold you with their hands and you won't hurt your foot on a stone. Then Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. I wanna let you know something. Just because you resisted temptation this time does not mean it's never gonna come again. When the devil's done tempting you today, he's gonna wait for the next opportunity to present itself. And I promise you, there's gonna be another chance for temptation to come. A lot of times we get high on our own supply because we made it out of that. We dodged a bullet and all the enemy is doing is retreating and waiting waiting for the next opportunity to come, just waiting to pounce. And some of you, you made it through this time, but he's going to get you on the next time because you thought that you were stronger than you actually are. He waited for the next opportunity to come. I got, a, I got news for you. You've gone through temptation, you're going to go through it again. You've gone through temptation, you're going to go through it again. You struggle before, you're going to struggle again. Until the next opportunity came. He's, all he's doing is waiting for you to get hungry one more time. Oh, I just need to wait for you to get hungry one more time. Temptation will always be more convincing when you are compromised. When you are compromised, temptation is always more convincing. You're not in your place of strength. You're in your place of weakness. The enemy will have an easier time selling you a meal when you've gone without one. Have you ever noticed how temptation tends to find you when you're famished? Temptation finds you when you're famished. Have you ever noticed that like, your old flame from high school always slides into your DMs when you're arguing with your spouse. It's like never when you guys are on your anniversary vacation and you're posting pictures like at the restaurant together. It's like, how did you know we beef in? <laughs> hey girl, been a while. <laughs> Como esta? <laughs> no bien, it's not bien. It's not bien. No bueno. How did you know? The devil is just waiting for you to be famished. He's waiting for you to be frustrated with the person you're committed to. It's like, now's the time. Now's the time. Not when everything's going well, but now. And then all of a sudden, they come into your DMs like a little sneaky snake. Like a little treasonous tarantula with treacherous tentacles just sliding all up in your business. Satan will tempt you with three C's. He comes at you with the temptation to consume, 
The temptation to compromise and the temptation to control. The temptation to consume looks like you're hungry, here's a snack. You're lonely, here's a person. Just consume it. Just partake. Just dabble. You need another fix? Here's the drug. The temptation to compromise. Did God really say you need to do that? Are are you really a child of God? Is that really your identity? Are you sure you need to hold fast to that rule? You can't bend it a little bit. There's There's not some wiggle room there. The temptation to control. This is a big one. Because a lot of times, man, like, like God, I, I could have all the good things in life if you would just hurry up a little bit. So what I'm going to do, God, is I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to take a little detour because I know better than you do. The only way to break free from getting trapped in the same cycle of satisfying your cravings is to change your desires. Your body is a tool. Your desires dictate how you use it. The only way to break free from being trapped in the same cycle of satisfying your cravings is to change your desires. There's a passage of scripture that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what that means is, listen, I actually have to send my physical body out ahead of my heart. I have to send physical things out ahead of spiritual things so that my soul, my spirit can catch up to the physical. So where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what that means is like my relationship with God is not where I want it to be. Are you giving? Are you generous? Are you serving? Are you giving your time, your talent, your treasures? Are you doing these things? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if you're spending all your money and all your time on things outside of the kingdom of God, your heart is in things outside of the kingdom of God. Why is my heart, why do I feel like I'm so far away from are you? Are you being generous? So I have to send my treasure to the place that I want my heart to follow to. Does that make sense? Your body is nothing but a tool. Your desires dictate how you use it. If you want your desires to change, you have to send your body out ahead of it. Sometimes, listen to me this morning, church. Some of you guys, you came to church today and you absolutely did not want to go, but you had to send your body there. And then when you got here, you're like, oh, yeah, I was supposed to be here today. I had to send my body as an unwilling hostage to church so that my soul could actually get fed. Number two, your body is a cover, your soul is the book. Your body is a cover, your soul is the book. Have you ever heard somebody say, don't judge a book by its cover? We say that because we all judge books by their covers, don't we? That's what we do. We judge books by their covers. I remember one time, my wife hadn't bought a book in years, and we walked through a bookstore, and she's like, I have to buy this book, and she went and bought it. I was like, why did you buy that book? She was like, because the cover said John dies at the end, and I have to know what happens. I was like, obviously, John dies at the end. (laughs) But the cover leapt off the stand and called to her, and she bought the book based off the cover, and we do this all the time. This is how human beings are. Many of you, you guys came in here today with a purse that you chose based off the monogram on the outside of the bag. A lot of you guys, you, you, the this, this sneakers that you wore in here today, you chose based off of whether or not they had a swoosh on the side. Many of you, you're sitting in here with a spouse that you chose based off the way their profile picture looked like on Bumble. Like we all judge by the outward appearance and we get stuck physically because we choose to only see naturally. We don't see things spiritually, and so we get stuck because we're looking at the outward appearance, and that's not the way God sees things. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus is talking to religious leaders that everybody else thought that they were put together, but Jesus is like, I see you for who you really are. You're like somebody that washes the outside of the cup, but the inside of the cup is dirty, and you're drinking from it, and I see you. In fact, you know what you guys are? You guys are like a graveyard that's painted pretty. That's what you guys are. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 7, the Lord says to Samuel, don't judge him by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We are physical people inhabiting a physical body, and so we look at other people's physical bodies, we look at other people's outward expression, and we judge them based off the clothes they're wearing, based off the way that they talk, the way that they carry themselves, their confidence level, their haircut, their height. All of these things are ways that we judge other people. And here's the thing. is a lot of times, that's, that's the mentality of the world. That's not the mentality of the kingdom. And a lot of times we bring that into church. And a lot of times in church, like how many of you guys, you grew up in church? 
Let me see some hands. You grew up in church. I've been in church since I was a fetus. I've been crunching Bible verses since before I was born. My first words were John 3.16. That's how long I've been in church. And here's a, here's a reality check. Like, I'm just going to put us all on blast if we were raised in church. If you grew up in church, you are often a trained seal in the art of performative Christianity. You come into worship. You go to Bible study. Like, you, you know what to do and what to say to convince people that the inside is as put together as the outside. You know how to carry yourself. You're trying to convince the world that you're a Christian because you got a massive bedazzled cross hanging out your shirt. I'm just trying to tell everybody that I love Jesus. If you need a cross to tell people that you're a Christian, there's a problem. Some of you guys, you come in here and you have back problems because your Bible's so big. You chose the biggest Bible you possibly could. It is like a dragon around a bag of cement behind you because it's got the concordances and everything. It's got the map of Israel. You got all those little tabs on the side that tells you what book of the Bible because you're not even sure where they at, but you want to make sure everybody thinks you've been reading. And you got highlighters and you highlighted passages you never even read just so when you open up the Bible, it looks like you've been taking notes and your lower lumbar is giving out on you because you dragging that Bible behind you like a ball and chain. And God just looks at all of it and God's like, come on. You're overcompensating. You can't always tell who has an authentic relationship with God based off of what you see on the outside. There's a passage of scripture where Jesus is talking about there's this one religious man and he's standing in the temple and he's praying and he looks over at a sinner standing over there. He's like, God, he won't even stand 10 feet away from him. He's like, God, thank you so much that I'm not like that wretched sinner over there. God, thank you. Thank you that I'm righteous, God. Thank you that I'm holy. Thank you that I'm sanctified. Thank you that I took communion. Thank you that I've memorized every Bible verse in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> and it says the man over there that was perceived to be a sinner, is, he came and looked up at heaven. He's just beating his chest saying, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Which one is more justified? And at the end of the day, man, it's like we're back in school. You guys remember when you were in school and you put a book inside of another book? You remember those, those days? You're like, oh, advanced algebra is fascinating. Oh, what a good read. Chemistry, phenomenal. God knows. Are you with me? God can tell. Make sure your cover matches the contents. And don't take the cover off the book. The world needs to see that you're a Christian. What's on the outside should be a reflection of what's on the inside. And what's on the inside should be visible on the outside. Your body is the cover. Your soul is the book. My third point, your body is a temple and the Holy Spirit is its resident. Your body is a temple. The Holy Spirit is the resident. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. There's a little bit of slight graphic uh, language in this passage of Scripture. So if you're little kids, I want to give you a bit of a warning. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20, it says this. Do you not realize? Do you not realize? I think this is such an important question because I think for a lot of us, we don't realize. It says, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Did you know that? Did you know that your body is actually part of Christ? Christ's body because sometimes we're going through life living as if we're not aware that our bodies are actually joined with Christ it says should a man take his body which is part of Christ don't forget and join it to a prostitute never the Greek word here is actually very very strong it's actually an exclamation like oh god no it says, and don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. So he's presenting a bit of a problem here. He's saying, hey, listen, if you're engaging in this sort of sexual sin, you have God in you. Are you thinking about that? Are you thinking clearly when you're engaging in these activities, when you're engaging in this, are you thinking about the fact that like, wait a minute, my body's actually one with Christ and now I'm bringing him into this scenario. He says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. 
And don't you, this is a famous passage of scripture, it says, and don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Before Christ, if you don't know a lot about scripture, before Christ, the Spirit of God would dwell in the temple. It would dwell in a physical building. Right now, like, there's nothing special about this building. But before Christ came, the presence of God would dwell in the temple, and it would be in this area of the temple called the Holy of Holies. And it was so holy and had to be so pure that nobody could go in there except for the high priest on one day out of the year. And he would have to spend weeks preparing himself to even step foot into the Holy of Holies. And then Jesus came, he tore the veil on that temple, and the Spirit of God left the Holy of Holies and came into you and I. Have you ever thought about the fact that your body is now that holy place that previous generations would spend weeks of preparation to walk into, and now God is there all the time, all the time. Since we are joined with Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in us, and every time we sin with our body, we are taking the Holy Spirit along for the ride. Is that a car you want to pull God into? I had a friend one time, and he went to prison because some of his friends called him up and said, hey, you want to go for a ride? He said, yes. He got in the car, not realizing that it was a stolen vehicle. And because they pulled up and took him for a ride in a car he had no business being in, he was charged, and it's on his record. And a lot of us, like, we're pulling up in a stolen vehicle. We're doing the same thing to God. We're inviting God into a ride he does not have any desire to be a part of because God takes the purity of his temple seriously. There's a passage in scripture where Jesus comes into the temple and he sees people dishonoring the house of God and he gets so furious he throws temple tables upside down because they were dishonoring the house of God. And I wonder what Jesus would do if if we applied that to like our modern context and what we do with ourselves. Like I wonder how that makes God feel. And this passage of scripture, it's talking about sexual sin. You could apply it to any number of sins, but we're going to stay on this one for just a moment because I want you guys to consider this. Statistically, you're in high school by the time you've had sex for the first time, and the average age of exposure to pornography is 12 years old. So many of us, we're, we're being exposed to things as a child that are getting us stuck physically, and we have images in our brain that are interfering and what God wants to do in our lives because we've exposed ourselves to things that God didn't design us to be exposed to. Like it's so much easier for this generation to get caught up in these things than it was for previous generations. It was really difficult for previous generations to be exposed to things that a 12-year-old can find on a cell phone in 30 seconds. And many of us end up stuck physically because we've been compromised sexually. And every time you have a sexual experience, you're becoming one with the person that you're intimate with. You're carving off a piece of the temple and you're selling it. And before long, the temple of God is being used to worship lust instead of worship the Lord. And the reality is your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Are you honoring God with it? The Bible says that he bought it at a high price. He gave his son for your body so that it might become his temple. He gave his son for you. It doesn't belong to you anymore. It's been purchased. Are you honoring God with your body? My final point this morning is that your body is a sacrifice and God is the recipient. Your body is a sacrifice. God is the recipient. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. How many of you guys are thankful for all God has done for you? So give your bodies to him because of that. Let them be a living and holy, not just living, but also holy sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable. Do you guys realize that when we used to give sacrifices before Jesus, they used to actually give animal sacrifices. The animals had to be perfect. They couldn't have any spot. And sometimes I think we're offering things up to God that are not acceptable to him. He says, let them be holy 
and acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A lot of us, we don't understand God's will for us because we are continuously being conformed to the patterns of this world instead of allowing God to change us from the inside out by changing the way that we think. And then we go and ask the number one question I get as a pastor is how do I know the will of God in my life? You know the will of God in your life when you stop conforming to the patterns of this world and you start letting God change you by changing the way that you think. You are transformed literally by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. You are taking your mind out, submitting it to God and saying, God, do with it what you will. My body is a living sacrifice. It is holy and acceptable to you. And I'm not buying into the narratives that the world tries to tell me because let me tell you something this morning, church. The world will try and spin a counter narrative just like Satan coming up. Are you really the son of God? Are you really? The world will try to trip you up with counterfeits and give you a lie in place of the truth. And the world, like I said before, the world is all about your body And there's a lie in culture, and I want to bring it up for just a second as an example. And I might make people mad when I say this, but I want you guys to hear my heart behind this. I'm talking about sexual purity. I'm talking about all this stuff. I'm not saying any of this so that you guys can use it as like, I'm a failure, I'm dirty, God doesn't love me, because the Bible says that there is no longer any condemnation for those that are in Christ. God is not obsessing about your past the way that you do. And you obsess about it because you're stuck in your physical body. You're not thinking spiritually in the fact that I'm no longer who I was. I am a living sacrifice to God. God has redeemed me. The old things are gone away. Everything's become new. So I'm not saying this so that you beat yourself up. I want to take shame off of you this morning and give you hope and joy today. So as I'm sharing this stuff, I don't want you to walk away feeling heavier than you did when you came in. You should walk out feeling lighter because God is calling you to something greater. So walk out of that shame and walk into some hope and some joy and some confidence this morning. But there is a lie that culture tells And I'm sure all of you guys have heard it. It's repeated ad nauseum throughout culture. It's a lie that says, my body, my choice. My body, my choice. This is spoken all throughout culture. Why? Because the lie of the enemy is he wants you to believe that your body belongs to you. Therefore, you can do whatever you want with it. That is not the truth of the kingdom. With this passage that we just read says, your body doesn't belong to you anymore. Jesus paid an ultimate price for it, and your body is now a living sacrifice to him. So the lie of culture is my body, my choice, but the truth of the kingdom is my body, God's glory. That's the truth of the kingdom. It's my body, but it's God's glory. It's my body, but it's God's glory. And my body has become a living sacrifice. It's no longer I that lives. It's Christ that lives in me. To be a believer is to die to myself. It's to say I was already dead in my trespasses and sin. When Jesus found me, I was hopeless. I was destroyed. I was devastated. I was dead. I was gone. And he came and breathed his life back into me. And he gave me a new name. He gave me a new purpose. He gave me a new identity. He gave me a new calling. He gave me a new passion. He gave me a new purpose. He gave me a new destination, a new trajectory. He gave me all of these things. So the body that I live in now is actually his. It is a living sacrifice to him. And I want to live my life not in a way that gratifies my flesh, not where I come and sell my birthright for the first pot of soup that presents itself to me. I want to change my desire so this tool that God equipped me with can be used for his glory to make a difference in this world because God created this body and so I'm just giving back the thing that he designed and saying God you use it for what you want to use it for God you created it you know it better than I do you have a purpose for it you have the hairs on my head numbered and you have a plan for me that is to prosper me and not to harm me so why would I want to hang on so tightly to this body and all that I've done so far is brought death upon it so I want to submit it to you become a living sacrifice, and allow you to use me for whatever purpose you have. God, I'm tired of being stuck physically. 
And I want to build momentum in my body by submitting myself as a sacrifice to you, God. You do what you do. (laughs) 